Hi, this is Dr. Claire, and this is our lecture on community ecology. Um, so community ecology, rather than being interested in one particular species, is interested in the entire community. So all the species that occur in any particular location and the interaction between all of those species. So you have predators, you have prey, you have uh, competitors, you have all of these different organisms that live together and interact. And so it's those interactions that we're really interested in here. All right. Um, so one thing you need to know uh, with about animals within their community is what we call their ecological niche. And their niche is kind of the spot that they take up within the community. So it's the, the, all the ways that the organism ne uh, uses resources and everything that that organism needs to survive. So that's something to do with space utilization, what food does it eat, what temperatures does it need, what are the appropriate conditions for, for mating, uh, what are its requirements for moisture, uh, all of those different um, abiotic factors, and then also um, how does it interact with other species in its group, so or in its community. So, what what other types of uh, of uh, interactions are important there? Um, and one of the impo uh, interactions is going to be really important in determining the niche, or the the spot within the community where the particular species lo is located, is competition. So interspecific competition is competition between two species where two species are trying to use the same resource and there's not enough resource to go around. Um, so you can have two different types of competition. You can have interference competition and that's when there's a physical interaction over a particular resource. So for example here um, there's a carcass and a hyena has chased away the vulture that wanted to eat that carcass. So they physically interacted and the hyena physically excluded the vulture from the carcass. Um, you can also have exploitative um, competition and w with that, um, there's two individual or two species that are using the same resources, but um, they might use them at different rates. Um, so, for example, if there are birds eating berries in a tree, they might not actively chase each other, but maybe the woodpecker in the front of this picture is um, eating wood, uh, eating the berries at a faster rate than the robin in the back, and so it, manip it monopolizes more of those resources and um, is still in competition with that robin. Okay. Um, so the competition does affect the, the ecological niche. So the fundamental niche is everywhere where a species could survive based on its physiological requirements and resource needs. So, uh, and, then, and then there's its realized niche, which is where the, you actually find the species um, based on its competition with other species. So here's a classic example with barnacles. There are two different species of barnacles, um, Stellatus and Balanoides. Um, and the fundamental niche, if Stellatus is by itself, its fundamental niche is very wide. It can live up near the, 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 the high tide line all the way down to the low tide line, so it has a very wide range in which it can live. It doesn't, it's pretty resistant to being dried out, and so it doesn't mind being at um, uh, close to where the water ends, right? Um, the Balanoides, on the other hand, has a much smaller fundamental niche. It can't tolerate being dried out, and so it only lives uh, below the low tide line where it's never going to have the water um, come off of it, basically. Um, now, those two barnacles are in competition for space on the rock. There's only so much space on the rock. And it turns out that the Balanoides barnacle can uh, outcompete. It grows faster and it can just kind of shoulder out all the Stellatus. So the Stellatus's fundamental niche is very wide, but it's realized niche where it actually lives when Balanoides is also president, present is very is much smaller. And so when uh, when Balanoides is present, it is, it is competitive, competitively excluded from the deeper waters and it only lives between the low tide line and the high tide line. Okay. All right, so competition is obviously a pretty important selective pressure. So what you tend to see is what we call resource partitioning, where different species um, utilize the resources and the environments differently. Um, so one way they can do that is by partitioning um, spatially. So different species that use similar resources are just found in different locations within the community. So here's an example with anole lizards. These guys are little insect-eating lizards. And they're in this community, there are four different species of insect-eating anole. So they're all using similar resources, but each one lives in a different location. There's one that lives up in the tops of the palm fronds, one that lives on the stems of plants, one that lives on the trunks of trees, and one that lives in the grasses and by partitioning into those different locations it reduces the competition for each individual. Um, you can also have resource partitioning by uh, utilizing slightly different resources within the environment um, and, and this can occur through what we call character displacement. So here's an example from Galapagos finches. 
um, where there's two species, where they live on islands apart from each other, um, the Fulganosa species and the Fortis species have very similar beak sizes. Um, they're each making use of the most common seeds on the, on the islands. Um, when they are present together on the same island, um, they're in competition for those seeds. And so individuals who are, have similar beak size are going to be in higher competition and they're going to have lower access to resources. Individuals with more different beak sizes will be selected for because they won't have as much competition. So what you see is that there's character displacement, the beak size shifts, and where the species are found together, the Fortis have a larger beak and the Fulganosa have a smaller beak. Okay. <clears throat> um, another interaction between species that's very important are predator-prey interactions, and that's where one uh, species consumes another species. Um, predation, of course, has very strong effects on prey populations. Um, here's an example of, of single cellular organisms. Uh, didinium is a, a predator that eats paramecium, and paramecium, if you put it in a little container and you feed it, it's going to do just fine, it's going to be happy, but if you add some didinium, those didinium are going to eat those paramecium, the population will decline, and in this particular case the population of paramecium declined so far that they went extinct, and then of course the didinium also went extinct in this little uh, laboratory experiment because there was nothing for them to eat. So uh, these predators do have very big effects on prey population sizes. And so what you see in the wild is that they're, they're, the populations of predators and prey tend to be very closely connected. So here's an example with rabbits and foxes. So um, rabbits reproduce very quickly. They're an R-selected species. Um, and so their populations can boom very quickly. When their populations start to boom, there's lots of food for foxes. And so then the foxes' populations start to go up. Once po fox populations start get to a certain point, though, that starts to, to depress the rabbit population. So the rabbit population crashes because there's too many foxes. And then when the rabbit population is very low, there's nothing for the foxes to eat. So their population goes down. Then that releases the rabbits and their population goes up again. So you have these explosions and crashes that you tend to see with predator-prey interactions. The other thing that you tend to see with predator-prey interactions is coevolution. So that's when the two species are impacting the evolution of the other species. Um, and predation has uh, can put very strong selective pressure on prey populations, but then any ad adaptation in the prey can put strong pre uh, strong selection on the predator population. So you may not think of, of uh, insects that eat plants as predators, but they are. They are consuming another animal or organism, and so that still counts as predation. So here's a really classic example of coevolution in uh, a predator prey system with monarchs and milkweed. So monarch butterflies um, lay their eggs on milk milkweed plants and the caterpillars consume the milkweed. That's harmful for the milkweed. So the milkweed has uh, evolved adaptations to try to allow, uh, try to prevent um, these caterpillars from feeding on the plant. So one adaptation that they um, came up with was the producing of a, a milky sap that gums up the mouth parts of the insects. Um, and that's why they're called milkweeds. Um, and the, so that would have prevented those caterpillars from feeding on them, except that that put selective pressure on the caterpillar. And the caterpillar evolved a behavior where it clips the stem right here to prevent, oh, you can't really see it, right there in the middle. It clips the stem to um, prevent the sap from getting to the end of the leaf. And so once the stem is clipped, the, the caterpillar can then eat the plant happily. Um, so the milkweed has another defense. It produces a very toxic compound that's poisonous to just about everything, but the monarch caterpillars have evolved an, a uh, resistance to that compound, and now they take the compound and sequester it in their tissues, so the caterpillar itself is now toxic to other organisms. So that this is an example of a co-evolutionary arms race where each adaptation is then met by an adaptation of the predator, and the, that causes an adaptation in the prey, and that causes an adaptation in the predator, and, and so you get this escalation over time. All right, some other species interactions that are really important are what we call symbioses. And symbioses are when you have two or more organisms that exist together in more or less permanent relationships. Um, so they're always found together, they're always associated with each other. Um, again, in a lot of symbiotic relationships, you have this potential for coevolution to occur. Um, and there are actually three different types of symbiotic relationships. There's mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. And we'll go through each of these individually. So in mutualism, um, both species in the relationship benefit from the relationship. So they're both, they both have some sort of 
positive outcome. So for example, um, bees and their pollinators. Um, the bee gets a tasty treat in the form of nectar from the flower, and then the flower gets its pollen transported to a different flower. So both individuals are benefiting. Um, another example we talked about in a previous lecture were acacias and the ants that live in them. So the acacia gives the ants a nice little place to live, and they produce these little, these little protein-rich fruiting bodies and nectaries to feed the ants. So the ant has all the food it needs and a place to live, and then the ants protect the acacia. So if anything tries to eat the acacia, the ants will go bite it and protect the acacia. So again, both species are benefiting. In commensalism, uh, one species benefits and the other species has, it has no effect on at all. Um, so an example here would be um, cattle egrets and cows. So cattle egrets are called cattle egrets because they're almost always seen with cows or other large grazing animals. Um, they follow those animals around and as the, that animal is grazing it scares up little insects and frogs and things from the grass and the cattle egret can eat those things. So the cattle egret benefits from hanging out with the cow. The cow doesn't care. It doesn't affect the cow one way or the other. Um, it would be perfectly fine without the cattle egret there, but the cattle egret doesn't do it any harm. So that's a commensalism. The last group is the parasitism. In parasitism, one species benefits at the expense of the other. So it's doing harm to the other species. Um, so one example would be ectoparasites. There's lots of different ectoparasites. All of those blood-sucking insects that we all hate um, are ectoparasites. Also, my, my favorite blood-sucking parasite is the land leech. There it is. Um, and uh, they, uh, they will find warm-blooded animals and suck their blood. So the warm-blooded animal is harmed and the leech benefits. Um, there's also a lot of endoparasites, so parasites that live within other animals, and they often have very complex life cycles. Um, here's an example of a liver fluke. Um, the, uh, the liver fluke lives within the liver of a cow, and that's where it reproduces. Um, and it, pr it produces eggs, and the eggs actually get pooped out. So the eggs go, p go through the cow's digestive system and get pooped out in the feces. Um, there are snails that like to eat cow feces, so they eat the cow feces. The, the liver fluke then goes into the snail and hatches and grows a little bit and then gets uh, deposited in the slime of the snail. And then there's an ant that eats the snail slime and then the, the liver fluke gets into the ant. It actually goes into the brain of the ant and changes the ant's behavior and makes it climb up onto the top of blades of grass, which ants don't normally do. But when it's up at the top of the blade of grass, it can be eaten by a cow. And so then the cow eats the ant the liver fluke is back in the cow where it wants to be and it can reproduce. Um, so, uh, so that's a, an example of an endoparasite with a very complex, very specific life cycle. All right, one more uh, type of important species are keystone species. Keystone species are species that have a uh, larger impact on their community than you might expect based on their abundance. So there's not a whole lot of them, but they have a really large impact on their community. So one classic example is beavers. Um, beavers cha completely change their community by building dams. So beavers go into what would be a stream community and turn it into a lake community. So they provide habitat for things that like still water, like fishes and insects and certain plants. And so that when, the, when you have beavers present, you have a much more, a much different community than you would have without beavers present. Um, similarly, another keystone species is the sea otter. Um, sea otter's favorite food is sea urchins, which are a type of echinoderm. And so uh, when you have sea otters, the sea urchin uh, populations are kept very low. Not a whole lot of other things like to eat sea urchins except for sea otters. Um, sea, sea urchins, though, are uh, like huge algae grazers. So what happens is that when you have sea otters, you have very happy kelp forests because you have lots of um, sea otters that are eating the sea urchins and they're keeping the sea urchin population down, which allows the kelp to grow. Uh, without the sea otters, the sea urchins take over, they eat most of the kelp, but the kelp provides a habitat for um, baby fishes and clams and other um, organisms that are, that are important. So uh, when you have sea otters, you have a very diverse community with lots of different species in it, and without sea otters, you just have a lot of sea urchins and not a lot of other things. So sea otters actually really increase the diversity of the uh, community. All right, that's my lecture on community ecology. Catch you next time.